reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 21. Genesis, chapter 21. We've been working our way through the book of Genesis the last several months. And we're going to wrap up chapter 21. Uh, You might remember Abimelech. If you were here a couple weeks ago, we were introduced to him in chapter 20. It was one of the sordid tales of Abraham. Uh, Abraham is our father in the faith, and yet we see he had serious flaws and sin. Uh, Chapter 20 was one of those when we were introduced to Abimelech. Uh, But now we read about this Abimelech again. And so we'll pick up the narrative at verse 22 and read to the end of the chapter. Hear the word of the Lord. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, they said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity. But as I have dealt kindly with you, so you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. When Abraham reproved Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech. And the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from my hand, that this may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore that place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, Yahweh, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. So far, the reading of God's word, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open because we're going to be referring to our text a number of times. Probably not your favorite text in Genesis. Uh, Maybe some of you would say, Abimelech, I don't really even remember reading about Abimelech or much about him. I mentioned we just were introduced to him in Genesis 20, but you think this text is a little bit unusual. What do we do with this? Well, there are certain things in the text that actually really highlight this is an important text. And that's the number seven. Number seven in the Bible is often a symbol of uh, perfection or completeness. But the name Abimelech in our text that we just read, Abimelech, his name occurs seven times. Uh, The name Abraham in the Hebrew occurs seven times. We note that seven lambs are set apart. And even the word swear and Beersheba, they have as their root word, the word Shiva or Shiva, which in Hebrew is the number seven. And so if you look at this from the Hebrew text standpoint, you know, seven's everywhere. Now, we're not going to get into numerology and say that you should play this number in some lottery or anything like that. But this text, it... It's maybe not our favorite Bible story. Again, many won't remember Abimelech. But the text is shouting at us, there's something really important here. Now, I think that we can learn a lot from Genesis 21. And one of the things is, namely, how should we as Christians, as sons and daughters of Abraham, how should we live in a world surrounded by unbelievers? Some would argue that we have a duty as Christians to use the government to make our culture a more just, godly place. But most attempts to legislate God's law are not going to work very well. Uh, Certainly, if our goal is a theocracy, that's not going to work. For example... What is the greatest of all the commandments in the Old and the New Testament, according to Jesus? 
first and the greatest is love the Lord your God. That's the, the biggest. Well, I guess to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, should we legislate this most important law in the Old and New Testament? Should we work to have the state enforcing what's arguably the most important? Well, I think it answers itself. It would be very problematic. If you're looking at a theocracy, you're interested in that, but that's not what the Bible teaches. Now, if someone is tempted to become a social justice warrior on the left or on the right to reclaim America's values using government, Genesis 21 tells us how we can avoid these errors and how we should relate to our unbelieving neighbors. How do we do that? Well, let's take a look at our text. God promised to give all the land of Canaan to Abraham, didn't he? Remember, we've read that quite a few times. Uh, Genesis chapter 13 and four, verse 14 and following, what do we read there? The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated, lift up your eyes, look from the place where you are, north, south, east, and west, for all the land that you see. I will give to you and to your offspring forever. God promised to give the land to Abraham and his descendants. But there's a problem in our text, isn't there? Does Abraham own the land? He does not. The land doesn't belong to Abraham. He's living in Canaan, but he doesn't own any of it. In fact, in Genesis 21, the land belongs to The Canaanites. Look at verse 23 and verse 34. Um, Now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or my descendants, but as I have dealt kindly with you, you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. What's the emphasis there? By the way, Abraham, you're just, you know, you're on a temporary non-immigrant visa here. And then verse 34 And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of what? The Philistines. So our text highlights an interesting thing here. God had promised the land to Abraham, and yet the Canaanites owned it. And the Canaanites controlled it, and they were living in it. So then, what do you do with God's promise? Is it worth anything? Well, of course it is. With God's promises, he doesn't lie. But with God's promises, timing is everything. God fulfills his promises in his time. Now, here's what we mean. And this is, I think, a really interesting part of the text. In verse 22... Uh, Let's read 22 and 23. At that time, Abimelech and who? Phicol, the commander of Abimelech's army, said to Abraham, God is with you. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants. But as I've dealt kindly with you, so deal kindly with me. This Phicol, we read about him again, too, verse 32. They made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech and Phicol, who? the commander of his army, they then rose up and returned to the land of the Philistines. We've we've met Abimelech. Who's this Phicol? Well, he is the commander of the army of Abimelech. In the Hebrew, it's literally sar sava is the phrase. It's not very common. This Phicol is the general of the Philistine army, the main general, the sar sava. And here, Abraham is living peacefully with Phicol and Abimelech and makes a covenant with them, basically a covenant of mutual advantage. They agree on what they can agree on. And they also disagree on eternal spiritual truths. Note well, Abimelech says, swear to me by God, not, you know, they don't know the name Yahweh, which is used at the end of the chapter. Swear to me by God, we know that God is with you, whoever he is. And what they do is they make a covenant, uh, what they can agree on, 
but they also disagree on eternal spiritual truths. So it's not that Abimelech and Phicol are early believers. Not at all. It's also important to note that Abraham does not try to gain God's promised land by force from Phicol. Rather, this is a covenant where there is coexistence. The only time we'll probably agree with the bumper sticker, but that's not what they mean. There is a covenant where there is coexistence. Now, let's turn the clock. It's interesting, Phicol the Sarsava, the commander of the army, he's mentioned twice here. Let's turn the clock forward about four to 500 years later to Joshua chapter 5. In Joshua 5, now we have the offspring of Abraham. It's now a great nation, the people of Israel. God has brought them out of Egypt, brought them through the wilderness. They are now with Joshua, about to enter the promised land of Canaan. And what happens? Who shows up as the Israelites are about to enter the land of Canaan 500 years later? Well, let's take a look at verses 13 through 15. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand. That means ready for battle. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of Yahweh. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of Yahweh's army said to Joshua, Take off your shoes, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This commander of the Lord's army, that same Hebrew phrase, very unusual, is used again, the Sar Sava. Except this time, the commander of the forces is not Phicol, the Canaanite, but who is the Sar Sava in Joshua 5? It's none other than the second person of the Trinity. We would argue a theophany, an appearance of God. This is the Lord. And so in Joshua 5, we have here a type or a shadow of Christ's second coming. The commander of the Lord Yahweh's army comes with drawn sword, and he is going to use the Israelites to destroy the Canaanites, the Philistines, and give the land to Abraham's offspring, the Israelites. You see, friends, so it's 500 years difference. But with Abraham and Phicol, we have the commander of the army making a covenant of mutual coexistence. But then, 500 years later, after, as Genesis 14 says, the cup of the Amorite's sin has reached its full measure, now we have the Lord as the Sar Sava, the commander of the Lord's army appearing with drawn sword. And at this point, he is going to bring judgment to all those who are sinful. And he will give the land inheritance to Abraham's descendants. Timing is everything. 500 years. But we see it marked. At one hand, the Sar Sabah in Genesis 21 and the Sar Sabah, who's the Lord, in Joshua 5. But it's important to note here that God still has not given the land to Abraham. In fact, when is Abraham, has Abraham gotten the land yet today? No. Is God a liar? May it never be. Abraham will receive the land. That day will come when the cup of the unbeliever's sin is full, has reached its full measure, where their time has run out, where all the elect are brought in, and where Jesus as commander, the Tsar Sava, returns to earth with, again, drawn sword. 
we read about that, Charles read that at the beginning in Revelation 19, which is talking about the last day. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on the horse is called Faithful and True. In righteousness he judges, and he makes war. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. This is the Sar Savah. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a what? A sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. On his robe and on his thigh he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Sar Savah of Joshua 5 is pointing us ahead to when Christ will return at the end of history with drawn sword as the commander of the Lord's army. And he will bring judgment to all those who are not perfectly righteous. So if we look at this redemptive historically, Abraham is promised the land, but he's not going to get it yet. And in the meantime, while he's waiting for that land, he has a covenant of mutual coexistence and mutual advantage with the Philistines that he is sojourning in their land. So, kids, have you ever gone camping and you've reserved the camp spot, but someone else is in your spot? You come there and say, what do you mean? We, We paid for this. We reserved this. And you think, what are they doing in our spot? That's kind of maybe what Abraham might have felt like here. The land is promised to him, and yet the Philistines are in the land, and their armies, and he's got nothing. So the message to Abraham is basically this. Be patient. It will be given to yours in the resurrection. So, How do we pass the time while we wait for that day? Uh, Abraham, it might have been hard to wait, but here are some guidelines for waiting for Abraham and even for us. You can't uh, read this text and understand it in its redemptive history without talking about the sword. We've already done that. The commander of the Lord's army in Joshua 5 and the commander of the Lord's army, Christ, in Revelation 19, is Jesus. And we read in Scripture that he is bringing the sword of God's wrath against sin. For all who, as we heard in Matthew 5, do not perfectly love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and all who do not perfectly love their neighbor as they love themselves, the wrath of God is coming. And there is not a person alive who will be able to stand before God on that day and say, I am a good, righteous person. We all deserve the sword, the wrath of God. But the good news of the gospel, friends, is that the commander of the Lord's army, he's not just going to come on the last day, but you know he also made an appearance, not just in Joshua 5. The Sar Savah made an appearance in our history 2,000 years ago. The commander of the Lord's army brought the sword of God's wrath 2,000 years ago, but what did he do with it then? He brought that sword of God's wrath against sin down upon who? The Romans, all the political opponents of the Jews who are making a mess of the land. He brought that sword of God's wrath down on himself. When he took upon himself all the sins of God's elect, all those who would trust in him, when all of our sins were placed upon Christ, the Sar Savah took that sword and he layered that sword on his own head. So that unrighteous people like me and you can have our sins forgiven, and the wrath of God could be completely satisfied if we trust and rest 
in the Sar Sava, Jesus Christ. So that's what this points us to. There is wrath. There is the sword. It is going to come. But the good news is that that sword has already come 2,000 years ago. And for all who trust in Jesus, there is now no more wrath. So having escaped God's wrath, what do we do as believers today? How do we deal with our unbelieving neighbors and citizens of Fort Worth in Texas? Now that we have escaped the wrath of God, now that we trust in the Sar Sava, Jesus Christ, Do we now take up the sword against others who do not love God and their neighbor as they ought? Do we have a world that's full of people who are just trying to love God and their neighbor as much as they possibly can? No. Well, let's read verse 23 in our text. Now, therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants or with my posterity, By the way, had Abraham dealt falsely with Abimelech before? Actually did, didn't he? Remember, he's the one that said, "Um, my wife, she's actually just my sister. And oh, she's carried off to the harem of Abimelech. I'm not going to say anything. Swear to me that you will not deal falsely with me or with my descendants. But as I have dealt kindly with you, Abraham, so you will deal with me. And with the land where you have sojourned. we are called to show the same kindness to unbelievers that they show to us. And we don't use government to advance the kingdom of God. Uh, We do not take up the sword of force of government. We're not jihadists. All right, but you say, okay, pastor, yeah, everybody knows that. But are you just saying, they're probably thinking right now, pastor, have you... Watch social media? Have you read what's going on in our culture? Have you read what candidates for public office are saying, you know, about infanticide and and just crazy stuff, you know, whatever political party you have? Are you just saying that we should ignore the evils and problems in our culture and just put our head in the sand? Well, no. But we're not called to take up the sword, at least the sword of the commander of the army. What sword are we definitely called to take up? We're called to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so, Christians and the church, we aren't lobbying to send people to jail, but we are going to call out the evils that we see. And not just that, we are going to vocally give people bad news, that they really aren't good people, (laughs) that God's wrath is coming. People aren't going to want to hear that, but that's what we are called to do. And then we're going to tell them the good news, that wicked people are forgiven by Christ and reckoned as righteous in God's sight by trusting in Jesus. How does this work itself out? I don't know, but I think in the past, we, we, as Christians, as we see this wave of opposition and the early signs of persecution coming our way, uh, it is very concerning. But as an example, we, we should think of this differently. The, the world doesn't have, we don't have a problem from a hostile world. The hostile world has the problem with us in that, you know, we'll say, look, we'll bake your cake for you. But on all my cakes, I'm going to put a rainbow and a cross. You know, a rainbow is a sign of God judges sin, and yet the only way we can escape God's wrath is through the work of Christ. I mean, so we use these as an opportunity to share. Heidelberg Catechism, Q&A 2, right? What three things must you know to live and die and enjoy this comfort? First, we we got to communicate this. First, how great my sin and misery truly are. Second, how I am set free from my sin and misery. Third, how I can live a life of gratitude for such deliverance. So we need to articulate the sword of the Spirit, the message of God's wrath against sin, but his mercy 
in Jesus Christ. The sinners like us. If he can save a guy like me, he can save anyone. And so we need, I think, friends, to be more vocal about sin and evil. But also, the only hope for wicked people is to seek refuge in Jesus Christ. Think, friends, that we need less lobbying for laws and concern about that, but more speaking Q&A 2 of the Heidelberg Catechism. And in the past, the church has focused on force. Uh, Sometimes people don't trust us. Abimelech maybe had a little bit of good reason to uh, wonder about Abraham. You know, when he said, please don't deal falsely with me or with my descendants, did he have reason to say that? Yes, he did. And so the church, have we tried to use the sword, as it were, to uh, kind of push things towards a more theocratic emphasis? I think we have. And we have been kind of nasty throughout the history of the church. I mean, Roman Catholics killed tens of thousands through the Inquisition and Protestants and the St. Bartholomew Day's Massacre. And Protestants responded by also killing thousands of Roman Catholics in Europe. And it's not just, oh, that was so 300 years ago. Guess who uh, ended up killing hundreds of Mormons in Illinois and Missouri not that long ago? It was Protestant Christians. We killed hundreds and hundreds of Mormons, forcing them out of their lands so they had to flee to Utah. So, you know, the church, we've not been the the definition of of toleration. People think without unjust reason, or with some justified reason, that religious people, um, we're all about ethics and punishing nonconformists. I think that we need to leave behind the focus on legislating laws, but do more speaking God's law and God's gospel, the gospel of grace. So what now? What do we do as Christians? That's the question that we asked at the beginning. Well, first, we need to rejoice in Christ's saving work. You have a great future inheritance in Christ, right? Are you getting that land inheritance? Do you have it now? Nope, even if you own real estate in Fort Worth, it's not going to last. People can take it away from you. But you do have a great inheritance to come in Jesus Christ. When the commander of the Lord's army does come, he will give Abraham and all Abraham's offspring, as it were, spiritual offspring, that new inheritance. The meek will inherit the new earth. So the one thing is we can rejoice in Christ's saving work. We have a great future inheritance in Christ. And while we wait for that future inheritance, we should go about our business. Verse 30, he said, These seven lambs take from my hand that this may be witness for me that I dug this well. Dig wells. Serve your neighbor. Make money. Verse 34, and Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. It's fine for Christians to be here, as it were. You know, we would probably disagree with Woody Guthrie. This land is not really our land. It wasn't made for you and me now. But we belong. And what else did Abraham do in verse 33? After the oath of mutual toleration, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree, and called there on the name of the Lord. Raise families, get married, have children, do business, serve your neighbor, and worship the Lord. In a sense, friends, we're all on F1 student visas. We are legally here. We are here for a specific purpose. And yet, we're not long-term immigrants. It's a non-immigrant visa. And so, as believers, it's perfectly fine to be here, to work, to serve our neighbor, to raise our families. But our real inheritance is not the United States of America. 
Our real inheritance is that new Jerusalem that Christ has secured. And in the meantime, since unbelievers can't avoid us, there are how many still? There's still millions of believers in the United States. We should be more vocal about our sin, about our neighbor's sin and wickedness, and the salvation and life held out through the great work of Christ and trusting in him. Unbelievers are stuck with you and me, and we should speak with the sword of the Spirit to tell them Christ's great saving work. Let's go before God's throne in prayer. Let's pray.